How many of you are here this morning? I saw Chris getting out of control last night. You know, when the cat's away, the mice do play. <laughs> no, it seems like it's been an awesome conference, awesome time. We desperately need the prophetic. We need to go to a whole new level, and we're getting very close where we're not going to make it without hearing from God on a, whole, a very a much, much higher level. And uh, I was awakened at 2 a.m. last night with a one of the most profound downloads of revelations I've ever had. And uh, I'm going to try to fit it in, fit some of it in. Uh, it's going to take me a long time to process it, all that I had, but I've got a lot to say this morning. So just tighten up your seat belts, okay? And uh, I title this message, The Main Thing. Let me see if I can get it on the screen. The Main Thing. Okay. Uh, you know, the world's falling apart. Do you realize it's falling apart faster and faster? Uh, things are speeding up. You know, last time that I remember them sending our U.S. carriers, uh, aircraft carriers, to the Middle East for a crisis, I was on the carrier. It was our newest carrier at the time, the John F. Kennedy, which is now a bunch of razor blades, I understand. It's been decommissioned and <laughs> whatever, but uh, I was on the carrier and we had 30 to, at least 30 days of uh, intense confrontation every day with the Soviets. I mean, where every day we thought this is going to get out of control and it's going to be World War III. And uh, I mean, it was in your face challenges. And... Um, we had a, you know, elevator on the ship that uh, was just for nuclear bombs. Solely, that's the only thing it was used for. Everybody knew it. So we, you know, you never wanted to hear elevator six is active because that meant they're moving nu nukes up on the flight deck. And I remember hearing that. When it was announced, Elevator 6 is activated, and uh, I went up on the flight deck myself to see it. And they loaded nukes on our Go Birds, which were the, the uh, fighters that are set on the catapults with engines running, ready to take off instantly. And I, I watched it with my own eyes, and we thought this is the end of the world. Um, Later, President Nixon, who was the president at the time, in the Frost interviews, he admitted, he said, we came closer to nuclear war at that time than any time in history, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think that we did. But, you know, it can't happen without the Lord allowing it. He's keeping us. Uh, but there's a time when he's going to allow some things to happen because there has to be a full manifestation of the evil. The ultimate battle between the good and the evil. And the evil's got to be manifested. But what is happening in the Middle East right now is going to come home to us. I was shown it in a dream several years ago. It was going to come across our southern border in hordes, what I saw from the pits of hell, things that had not been released on, upon the earth for like thousands of years, like from the time of Noah even. And it came up out of the pits of hell. 
and came across our southern border. And it basically was all over our country. It's here, maybe in this room now. Uh, we are going to face some things that they're on the front line of facing right now of a spirit that has been released and a deep darkness that must be released upon the earth because at the end of this age, all of creation is going to say, let's don't ever try to run this world without God ever again. We cannot do it without him. And uh, the whole creation is going to see it, know it, all of the earth. The Lord's going to stop it. He's not going to let us destroy ourselves. Then he's going to restore it to the paradise it was originally created to be. And that's what we have to look forward to. Now, <clears throat> I've been through a bunch of challenges lately, physical challenges. Uh, I, they're called momentary light afflictions. Okay. Now, I can tell you this. I never knew that pain could hurt so bad. <laughs> uh, I was kind of, I don't know, I guess heartless. I just... You know, I've been around, seen a lot, had plenty of stuff, but I just didn't have much compassion for people who were hurting. I could see a compound fracture and say, okay, shake it off, rub some dirt on it, and come on, let's keep going. You know, I just didn't have any kind of compassion for that. I think now I'm getting some compassion. <laughs> you know, I really had no idea it could hurt this bad. Uh, and uh, just a couple of nights ago, some of the worst I've ever felt in my life. Every time this happens, though, the Lord speaks to me louder and clearer than I've ever heard him. At the same time, and I'm just so in awe of how, you know, it's one thing for your family or a nurse to really be with you there, helping you fight through stuff. It's another thing that the King of Kings will come down and just go through the worst of the worst, you know, with us and even get closer. And I'm saying the whole time, Lord, you know, you could stop this. <laughs> you could fix this. <laughs> but at the same time, a revelation comes that after that revelation, I say, this was worth it. I knew I was worth it many times over. And I could not, and I know right now, there are some things I could not have seen, could not have understood without that pain. Couldn't have happened. And there's some things the world's just not going to get without the pain, without the trouble. Okay, and I really do. I, uh, the, these are momentary light afflictions. Uh, I am so thankful for every one of them. I try to thank the Lord while they're happening. I try to keep that attitude. It says that everything will work together for good. And this is an everything. This is, it's going to work out for good. So start thanking him. Face it with faith, not fear. And doubt. Uh, but you know, we've really got to do it. We can go through this with joy. I can really say I've experienced the worst pain I ever thought was possible because I thought you would pass out when you got to a certain levels of pain. You just couldn't stay awake. And I can say now you can experience the worst pain and some of the greatest joy at the same time. Now, I want to go through this with joy. I think you do. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, I was shown years ago, at the end of this age, God's people were going to be so full of joy, the whole world was going to think we're retarded. 
We don't really understand what's happening. And, uh, but I tell you, it's going to be because of joy. Now, you can't have joy without the peace. We're going to go through the most trying times the world has ever experienced with peace. Total peace. Not going to shake us. Not going to rattle us. The world, they're going to think, yeah, they'll think we're retarded, just don't understand. But after a while, they're going to, they're going to know, no, we're the ones who understand. We've got a reality above anything on this earth. And we do. We do. But anyway, I've got a few things I need to share you, share with you about walking in a higher level of prophetic. Basics about the prophetic. These are basics. But without them, we can't get there. He can't give us more. We can't be trusted with that kind of firepower. And we're supposed to be walking in more than anything the old covenant prophets walked in. Anything. We have a better covenant. We're told in 2 Corinthians 3 that the glory that Moses experienced so that he had to put a veil over his face for the glory, we're supposed to be experiencing more glory. Where's the glory? We've got to see the glory. It talks about the time when darkness comes over the earth and deep darkness, the people, his glory is going to appear. And his glory is going to appear on his people. This is what he's getting us ready for. And I tell you, the glory is going to make it worth it. It's going to make all the darkness go away. And it's going to make all the nations turn to the light. The very scripture where he says, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. It says, his glory will appear upon you. The next verse says, and the nations will come to the brightness of your rising. They're going to come. They're going to see the light. But he's trying to get us right. Don't waste your trials. One thing Bill Johnson said a few weeks ago when he was here, in a powerful statement, he said, if the Lord inhabits the praises of his people, who inhabits our complaints? You know, it was because of grumbling and complaining that that first generation was not allowed to enter the promised land. So we've got to resolve right now, we will not complain. We can beg for mercy. That's not the same as complaining. I have to admit, a few nights ago, I begged for mercy. I said, Lord, I can't handle anymore. This is, please stop, give me some relief. And he did. Uh, we can do that. But I don't want to beg for mercy I mean, I, I want mercy and grace all the time, but I don't want to get relief from the trial until it's done its work. Because I know if you don't let it do its work, you're going to have to do it again. Because he's got to do it. He's got to prepare us for what's coming. Now, true discernment. Philippians 1.9. And this I pray, that your love may be abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. You know, you cannot have real knowledge or true knowledge or discernment, all discernment, without love. Much of what we think is discernment in the body now is suspicion based more in fear than faith. Rooted in fear and even paranoia. We cannot discern anyone accurately if we don't love them. I'm a, you know, Lord sh showed me something last night. It was hard for me to believe when the Lord was right there saying it to me and I knew it was true. It was still hard. I'm going to share with you some things today that are hard to understand. But we have to get this. 
If you don't love somebody, you're not going to discern them accurately. We've got to love our enemies. Even the worst enemies, we've got to love them. If we don't, we're not going to discern them. Guess what? Perfect love casts out all fear. And every bondage of the enemy is rooted in fear. We can't, those enemies, some of the worst enemies are supposed to be our friends. We're supposed to bring them into the kingdom. Okay? They have a calling and a destiny. And we've got to see them the way God sees them. Now, here's something. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Does he really mean that? Can we possibly get our whole mind around this? Doesn't our mind just fly off in all kinds of directions all the time? You know, can we really take every thought captive? Every thought? I was shown a couple of nights ago how much damage our wayward thinking, our wayward thoughts are doing to us. And how out of sorts they're making us with God. And how we have to take every thought, every one, where we are disciplined and we do not allow, allow our minds to run amok. Whether through fears, through anything, uh, greed, lust, anything, that it no, this is our mind, we're going to control what it thinks about. It's called self-control. And we really have to take every thought. We can't do it ourselves, can't do it in our strength. But if we will resolve to do it, he will help us. He sent the helper for that. But you know, his name is the helper, not the doer. He's not going to do his part until we do our part. We resolve, we commit, we do all that we can while knowing it won't be enough. This is over our head. We need him, but we have to do our part. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the, all the law and the prophets. The Lord summed up all of those commandments in the law with these two. And they do sum up the law. If you love the Lord, you're not going to worship idols. If you love your neighbors, you're not going to envy them, steal from them, murder them, or anything else. You're not going to do the do nots if you do the two simple do's. Love the Lord and love one another. This has to be our main goal every day and growing in it. Being magnified in it. You know, I wish I could take time to really lay this out, but we are establishing in this life our eternal capacities. Especially for such things like love, joy, many things like that that we're establishing in this life. The capacity that we will have for eternity. You don't want to waste this life. You don't want to waste a single trial. You want to grow. You want to expand. You want to mature. Let it do its work. It's impossible for the devil to get a shot in while God isn't looking so he's allowing these things and he says he will cause all things. That includes all things for good. So how can we not thank him? Doesn't it say in everything give thanks? Our first response should not be fear. It should not be oh no. It should not be a complaint. It should be thanksgiving. 
gratefulness. Thank you for this new trial. Now, I've shared that over and over for years now. How important it is, I'm not going to do it a lot more today, but this is something we've got to get and we've got to do. I've been preaching it for years and years, but not doing it. I mean, I've done it to a degree, but not like I could, not like I should, and not like we, we have to. Because it is a language of faith. You know, Peter Lord used to say the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's what we're talking about, and that's what we've got to do. Keep the main thing the main thing. Knowing God is our most important task. What did he say eternal life was? Knowing the Son and knowing the Father who sent him. Did he not say that is eternal life? This is how critical. If it's that critical, it is, it, is this something on our daily agenda? It's been on mine for a long, long time. Where I get up every day, Lord, help me to, to know you better. Please send the spirit of revelation and the knowledge of you. Because without that, I can't do number the, the next thing. Loving God, which is our highest purpose. God is love. So I've, I found out you cannot find out anything about God without loving him more. He's the most lovable being in the universe. In all of creation, because he is a creator, but there's nothing, no one more lovable than God. You know what? There is no greater joy than you that you can experience than through love. Loving him and loving somebody else is a key to the highest joy. But the, our main job description as human beings is to love God. Do we really seek to do that more and more every day? And I believe this is something we have to do daily. Not once a week. Not once a month. It's daily. I remember, I don't know if you saw the Movie Ford versus Ferrari. Absolutely great movie. A friend of ours here who I don't see, Nicholas, Papa the, he's blind, has a little white dog, seeing eye dog that uh, walking around here. He used to own Aston Martin cars, and he uh, had a team, a race team in that race that was in them, and he knew all the characters in it. And we watched that movie with him, and he gave us all the backstory. Let me tell you something else about Nicholas. Now, you've seen the commercials, the most interesting man in the world. Well, he's the real one. <clears throat> I mean, but this is one of my favorite things about is his mother, Nicholas's mother. Now, Nicholas's father was the aide-de-camp to the king of Greece, and they're just a well-known, powerful family. Nicholas was a VP for Aristotle. He was the VP for Aristotle Nassus when he was 24 years old. He went on to build his own ship, big shipping business, own those gigantic oil tankers and stuff. I mean, he's just done a bunch of stuff, but... Uh, Nicholas's mother, you know, his fam family's very well known, uh, but she started having experiences where Jesus would come to her at night in a dream and take her to outer space. Take her out and show her things in outer space, galaxies and all kinds of things. And she would come back and she would tell people, Jesus came and got me, took me to outer space, and she would paint. She was an artist. She would paint what we, she was shown. Now, her art is very famous. It's in the Smithsonian. It's, you can get books of her art and everything. But her main thing became space art. 
But everybody said, we've never seen these galaxies. We've never seen these stars until they put up the Hubble. And you know that first picture the Hubble took? It's called the Hubble Deep Field. It's called the most important image ever taken. When instantly, as far as our perspective of the universe, it expanded hundreds, thousands of times over instantly. This universe is far bigger than we ever thought. But one of the first things they recognized We've seen this before. It was in her art. You may have heard of James Webb and the James Webb telescope that has kind of been put up. It's much more advanced than the Hubble was, seeing things the Hubble couldn't see. Well, James Webb himself brought Nicholas and his mother and father and everybody to NASA. He was the head of NASA for a while. And uh, just to honor them and her for her art. And then the Soviet space agency. This was back, there was still, we still had the Soviet Union. They invited her to Russia, to Star City. The most, you know, most people don't even know this exists. It's this ultra modern super city where they do their, their space thing is based they brought her over there to honor her there in the Soviet Union for her art. And Nicholas said he had never seen so many generals, high Soviet officials, as cosmonauts and everybody else. And how he, you know, he talked to many of them and how much it meant to them that her art proved God to them. There was a creator. There was proof. This was proof to them that he was showing them what is out there before we could see it on our own. But uh, anyways, quite a story. By the way, Nicholas is actually a lieutenant general in the Ukrainian army and the Soviet, in the Russian army. <laughs> He's fighting himself. <laughs> I mean, he was given this honor, honorary generalship by both countries. But a uh, really interesting character. We, we've done some, uh, you know, videos on Nicholas and all the things. But the, this thing of his mother and that art, I've got this big, you know, coffee table book full of it, his art and uh, uh, her art. And you ought to look it up. Her name was Papa Nicolau. I can't remember her first name, but Nicholas is Nicholas Papa Nicolau. But uh, one of the things the Lord showed me a few years ago, he said he was going to give us the miracle of the Hubble. It's a number of years ago. So I looked it up and there's an event that was called the miracle of the Hubble. You know, when they first sent that satellite up, turned it on, pointed at something, took a picture, it couldn't see anything. It was blind. Because the, you know, the lens had not been ground to the, the precision required for it to be able to see at those distances. And they said it was off by about the thickness of a human hair. Instead of seeing all these awesome galaxies, everything, couldn't see anything. We're off a little bit. We can have a whole lot of revelation and think we're just seeing everything and not be seeing much at all. You know what they did? They had to send up a space shuttle with a crew to basically put a contact lens on the Hubble telescope to fix the problem. Then they pointed it at what they said was a piece of space about the size of a grain of sand where they didn't think there was anything. This is nothing there. We know this is just empty space. Let's point it there first and just take a picture. 
You know what they, that picture was? The Hubble Deep Field. The most important impression ever taken. Instead of being empty space, there were hundreds of billions, of not only stars, but galaxies. Each made up of hundreds of billions of stars. Somehow this is going to happen to us. The Lord's going to fix our vision. Where all of a sudden we're going to be able to look at somebody where we don't think there's God's not doing anything with them. There's nothing going on there. And he's going to give us vision. And we're going to be able to see the awesome things God is doing in that person. We're going to be able to look at a church where we think there's nothing happening. There's, a de there's dead as dust. You know, those churches, many of those churches that we think are the deadest are the highest worshipers in heaven who are renowned in heaven because as dry as it is and as hard as their lives are, the people that are in it, they still worship. They worship from their hearts. And that touches the Father like you can't touch him when you're in heaven. When you're there in his glory, you have to worship. You cannot help but to worship. And he knows that. But when you're, we're going through all the stuff that we're going through and still worship, that touches him more than anything we'll be able to do like that then. Don't waste your trials. Worship. Worship. Now, we're seeking advanced prophetic. At some point, it's going to be more than advanced prophetic. I hope you've advanced during this time. I think the Lord's certainly been here. I could tell it when I came through the door. He's been here. He's still here. Most important things that happen at a conference, not what's happened here. It's what happens six weeks from now when you're home. It's had affected your life, had changed, impacted your fellowship, your love for God, and things like this. This is the real important thing. We appreciate, we, we pray and seek for you to have an encounter with Him while you're here and know it, and it be something that is a demarcation point in your life. But more than that, we don't care if it comes here, care comes later, comes weeks later, or whenever, but that it happens. We have to go to a new level. We cannot stay here lest we die. We cannot stay here. Now the foundation of the true prophetic is friendship with God. That's it. It's not the gifts. It's not how intelligent we are, how spiritual, how righteous or you know, holy or whatever. It's not, the, it's friendship with him. Where he says in Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord our God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. There's nowhere in the law he, that's a, he's obligated to do that. There's nowhere he had ever said in his word he's not going to do anything without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. Why is that? Why is it he won't do it without? Because the prophets are his friends and he doesn't want to do anything without his friends. Our job is to get so close to God, be so totally captivated with him, joined to him, where he, you know, the love of God consumes us. That we are so close, we see everything that goes on around his throne. And that he doesn't want to do anything without showing it to us. Do you get that? That's our main job. How do we get closer to God? It's the one thing we can all do. And guess what? Every single one of us is right now as close to God as we want to be. 
He said, if we seek him, we'll find him. If we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. So we are right now as close to God as we want to be. How bad do you want him? How close do you want to be? So this is the essence of the prophetic ministry. But the Lord will only allow his closest friends, his most trusted friends, close to his throne. He needs people who abide there. To do our job, we need to abide there. Could I get a water from the table? Someone bring me a water. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, good. Now, one thing I was shown last night. His best friends are intercessors. Now, don't you think you've heard that a thousand times? I showed how they were. I was shown how they were, why they were. Doesn't it say he ever lives to intercede? It says Hebrews 7, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is right now making intercession for us. If we really are abiding in him, what are we going to be doing? Did he really mean we're supposed to pray without ceasing? We chose to do something like that that we couldn't do. We can pray without ceasing. We've got to. We've got to get there. This is a key to discipline our mind, taking every thought captive, getting the mind that is being so filled with evil, dark thoughts, fearful thoughts, all kinds of evil and darkness is getting in because we don't have control of our minds. The devil can just, you know, it was the city without walls and the walls are called salvation. He said, I will call your gates praise and your walls salvation. If we really are walking in salvation, we, are, we should have walls around our minds. Isn't it the helmet of salvation? Where there are walls protection, where these things cannot get in? A key to this is walking in the salvation. Salvation isn't something we just believe. If you really believe it, you'll have it. It's not a doctrine. If it's just a doctrine, we can believe in our minds and be fine. Believe in our minds doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah, I really meant that. It may not accomplish anything other than deceiving you. You can believe right doctrine and be deceived by it, if you believe that believing right doctrine is what this is all about. You've got to believe in your heart for it to result in righteousness. And we believe in our heart when we start living what we claim to believe. He came to be the way, the truth, and the life. He's not just a formula. The way is not just a way to do things. A way is a person. Truth is not just accurate doctrine. You can have all doctrines and believe them totally accurately, not be walking in truth if you don't know Jesus as your life. So, as part of the first miracle, which I believe was a revelation, this first thing he has to do in us. Turn the water into wine. The water is his word. The wine is spirit and life. Well, we don't just believe things, we live them. And we really get at everything we believe, we confess, we're going to live. 
We're going to actually do this. Okay. The aspect of this that I was shown last night, I'd never thought of before, never seen, never considered. It was a casual question. I really, you know, I've begun to learn that whenever you're dealing with intense pain or something like that, Jesus will be even closer. So find him. Turn to him. You know, not don't look at the pain, look at him. Okay, so last night I just know, okay, he's going to be really close. And I found him. <laughs> I said, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> in that place, he to me, he speaks louder and clearer than in any other place. There's a verse from the past. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, this is the part, this is what really got me. I was, I said, Lord was, you know, just in the, the night comforting me. And I was really troubled by some things I'd been shown in Dreams and visions, it seems, are unfolding now, like the battle in the Middle East. I felt like I was shown this scenario years ago. For, for a long while, I only showed, shared it with a very few friends and some people in the intelligence community that I knew could get it to the right place. But I saw, in this onslaught against Israel, I saw this strategy to overwhelm the Iron Dome and David's sling by just showering Israel with thousands of missiles at the same time, and it would overwhelm. And in the midst of this overwhelming their defenses, they were going to slip a nuclear missile in. And it hit what was called the wicked city. In my dream, it was called the wicked city. Now, I don't know if this was a nuclear bomb or it could have been a dirty nuke. I don't know. A dirty nuke can do the same thing. Kill just many people. You know, where it's not an explosion, it's the radioactivity that kills. But I know they got hit with a nuke. Totally destroyed the city of my dream. It seemed like over a million people died in Israel, in the wicked city. Now, you can't imagine a tragedy like that. But it happened, and the result was all Israel repented. They knew it was because of the wickedness in that city that God had allowed it to get through, had allowed this to happen. All Israel turned to the Lord. Maybe this is the time in Scripture. There's a Scripture in Romans talks about all Israel will come to the Lord. And in my dream, this it happened then. They all turned to the Lord, and much of the world did. And they knew right away it was because of the wickedness and that God was judging this wickedness. He judges his own household, his own people first. But this judgment upon this wickedness is coming upon the earth. Now, it was such a bold, graphic dream. Anyway, I shared it with the people I thought that could maybe say, we've got to do something else. <laughs> you know, that Iron Dome, that David Sling, they're good defensive measures. They're not going to work in what's coming. And I felt like that's what's happening with Hamas. Hamas is expending its rockets mostly to deplete Israel's supplies of defense, the David sling and the you know, Iron Dome defense missiles. We're trying to resupply them. We can't. There's not enough. We don't have enough. Hamas has over 100,000 much more advanced rockets 
at the right time, I think they're going to turn loose. Uh, this is a predicament they're in. And I was just so deeply troubled by this last night. And when, you know, I had that close encounter with the Lord, I said, Lord, how do you feel about this? Lord, you know, tell me, what is, is this it? Is this, this my dream? He, he said something that was shocking to me. He said, it's hard to bear. I said, wait a minute. Am I thinking, I'm going, wait a minute, you're God. What can be hard for you? What can be hard for you? How could this be hard for you to bear? He said, why do you think I seek intercessors? Those who will help me carry the burden. I never thought about that. I thought about how we help people. We help the church. God doesn't need help. Now suppose, you know, there, there are things that scripturally God cannot do. He could do them, but he has limited himself. Purposely limited himself. For example, sin. When you confess sin, he cannot even remember it. And you start bringing it up later, when you've already confessed it, he's going, what are you talking about? Because he has forgotten it, he's removed it, and he has fixed it so he cannot remember it. Now he has the power to, he's God, he can do all things, but he has decided, I'm not going to do that. Okay? Do you know he bears our pain? He bears our sorrows? I, you know, I experienced tiny, maybe one zillion, gazillionth of the pain that God feels last night. That I know this is a part of what intercessors understand. They're bearing, helping him bear his pain. His sorrows. He has made it so that he needs us. That's why he looks for those who will intercede. And why it is so critical that we get this. We really get this for his sake. Now, I want to go a little bit further, but keep this thought in mind. There are several things I want to talk about, a couple of them to help you to understand this is a biblical, soundly biblical truth. God has limited himself to in some ways need us. We have to have him. He has put himself in the position of needing us. And if we don't come through, no, he'll get through it. I mean, he's going to, he's God but it's going to be far more difficult for I felt his pain. You know, he bore our sin on the cross. When he said it's finished, sin was done with. The redemption's done with. It was after that he's talked about bearing our sorrows, feeling our pain, bearing our pain. This is ongoing. This is why he ever lives to intercede. Okay. We need real intercessors, not fakes. We need real prophets, not fakes. There's fake news. There's fake science. There's real science too. You can't have a fake without the real. They're fake. They're false prophets. But there wouldn't be false prophets if there weren't real ones. He said, I am going to send you prophets and wise men. He's sending them. But there are going to be many false. There are many false intercessors. that are faking it. They'll fake bearing these burdens because it seems spiritual. Don't ever fake anything in God. 
Don't fake worship. You defile it when you do that. Worship is holy. These things are holy. Do not fake it. Why do we fake things? I believe it's mostly to appear righteous before men, to look spiritual. If I were, Paul said if he were still seeking to please men, he would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. When we do that, if we do that, if we do things before men, we're canceling out the real. We're not going to be trusted with the real. Everything we do to be seen by men, I believe is fake, false. And we give ourselves to the false, we're going down the wrong path. And one of them, you give yourself to the false prophetic, you're going to be a false prophet. There are false prophets, and I've met many. I've met quite a few. Every one of them I could discern had a calling to be a true prophet. They went down the wrong path. Start faking it. First Kings 17, 1 and 2. This is the first place Elijah's mentioned. And listen, it is the spirit of Elijah that we desperately need manifested upon the world at this time. <clears throat> he is coming, the Lord said. At the end of this age, he's coming. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. <clears throat> he's going to restore all things, it says. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, remember this first time he appeared, Ahab didn't know who this guy was. He says to him, the king of Israel, as the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, Surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. He didn't, say, he didn't say by the word of the Lord. He said by my word. First word out of his mouth. And I'm sure Ahab probably said, who is this nut? Did he get out of the asylum? Somebody get him back? What is he doing here? But I tell you, this is a key to the prophetic. This is a key to walking in the authentic prophetic. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand. He stood before the living God. He lived his life before God, not men. That's how we got to live. We should not care. It should not affect us. If all men think we're crazy, if all men think all manner of evil about us. But if we're standing before the living God, we know it. That should be all that matters. If you know that God approves of you, that he sent you, let the whole world call you false. Let the whole world rise up against you. It's not going to do any good. If you've seen him how can you be impressed with men? Who are presidents? Who are kings? If we've seen the king of kings, if we live in him. We have authority today. We have authority right now to walk boldly into the throne room of God and meet with him face to face. It's better than having the authority to walk into the Oval Office or any other palace. We can do it at any time. How many of us are actually doing it? I'm just saying. Luke 16, 15. You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. You want to be approved by men? You're going to be doing what's detestable in the sight of God. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the false prophets. Why do we want 
men's respect. Why do we want men to like us, to respect us, say good things about us? Why does that even matter if we know that the king himself is for us? How about this one, John 5, 44? How can you believe when you seek glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only true God? How can you believe? How can you have real faith? And the same word translated glory is also translated recognition. Is what we're doing seeking recognition? Is what we're doing in our worship, we want people to recognize us as worshipers? Is what we're doing when we're interceding, trying to get people to recognize us as intercessors? How can we believe when we do that before men instead of the one and only true God? This causes us to be fake to be false. How about this one? But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. How would you like to be called Satan by the Son of God? That was real edifying. You are a stumbling block to me. Didn't he say, it would be better not to even be born than to be a stumbling block for even the least of his little ones. And here Peter is being a stumbling block to the Son of God himself. How could it get worse than that? How was this happening? He tells him, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Intercessors don't pray out of sympathy for men. God hears those prayers from them. He needs those who will pray out of sympathy for God. Can you hear that? Who want to bear his burdens with him, praying from his perspective. It's a whole different ballgame than what many conceive of is intercession. James 4.4, 4, he says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world, sympathy with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. John 7.17, 7, if any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. Before we're going to know the truth, do you know you cannot understand the book of Revelation without being a bondservant? And there are very few Christians who are bondservants. There are actually very few Christians that are disciples. Jesus gave a very clear definition what his disciples were like. And you read Jesus' definition, you will say, I don't even know if I know any. It's true. Now that's okay. You may still be saved. You can be, a dis you can be saved and not be a disciple. Weren't most of those who followed Jesus when he walked the earth, they were true followers. They believed in him. But they weren't the disciples, that was a new level. And our calling as a great commission is to make disciples. We're looking for those who want to walk with him on that level. And only when you've been a disciple, according to his definition, can you be called to become a bondservant. That's just a whole new thing. You're no longer your own. Time is not your own. Your thoughts are not your own. Your mind is not your own. You belong to another. And it's a way to live. And it's not just believing these things or believing that we're called to them. It's actually working it out 
in our life, working out our salvation. We really become these things. But, you know, the book of Revelation was given to John. Jesus gave it to him. He said, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to give to his bondservants. If you're not a bondservant with the mentality of a bondservant, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to get it. You can pick up a few things, but mostly you're just not going to be able to understand it. We've got to become bondservants. First, we need to be, a, you can't be a bondservant until you've been a disciple. You need to do that. Only after you've been a bondservant will he at some point say you graduate and become a friend of God. You know, I believe there are people right here that are going to be God's friends and some of his best friends in the last days. Absolute best friends of God. Guess what? He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know, all Christians tend to take that. We're ambassadors for Christ. And in a very general sense, we are. Very general sense. We all claim to be sons and daughters of God. In a very general sense, we are. As opposed to being sons of the devil or daughters. Of, you know, we are. But there's a position called sons of God, that this that's a whole new level of something. That uh, if you've met one of them, you know it. But <clears throat> you've got to become a friend first. And then he can promote you to being a member of his own family, adoption, family. But, you know, generally speaking, all Christians think they're ambassadors. And in a general sense, we are. We should think of ourselves that way. Try to represent his kingdom. But that is a very special, high calling, high anointing. Very few actually, <coughs> actually have. Paul the apostle was an ambassador. That's why he had to appear before King Agrippa and these others and Caesar. He was an ambassador. When he was saying, we are ambassadors for Christ, he was talking about him. Okay? But I think it's something we should all esteem and seek to be, just like we should all be seeking to have his mind. But ambassadors in those days, guess what? They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the internet. And the only people who could be appointed as an ambassador to represent the kingdom in those times were the king's very best friends who were of one mind and one heart with him and would not misrepresent him. Because they're going to go away and not even be able to communicate for months and months. And even then, they would change out their ambassadors every two years because they felt like after two years of being in a, a foreign place, they would start taking on the sympathies of that land and start representing the, the needs of the land they were sent to rather than the land that had sent them. So he had to rec they were recalled. Two years at the most. Now we get compromised. We're, if you're an ambassador, you're on a full-time assignment and you don't get recalled. We have to have that communication with him, with the king. We have to be of one heart and one mind. But only his best friends will be sent as ambassadors. To be prophetic, we've got to be delivered from the shallowness. Do you know what? <clears throat> Any truth that is institutionalized gets corrupted. 
When Christianity got institutionalized, it got corrupted. That's why we're told in Hebrews, Jesus suffered outside the camp. Let us go to him, therefore, outside the camp. Jesus never became a part of the camp. He never joined the camp. He was never a part of the institution, never a part of the establishment. If you're part of the camp, you're going to start prophesying from the camp's perspective. You're going to start praying from the interest of the camp. We've got to really get what this means in these times. Christianity was corrupted very early. Any truth institutionalized gets corrupted gets politicized. We've got to go to him again outside the camp. Now in the Lord, he can make up the years of locusts have eaten. He can deliver us from all the evil and garbage that we took on being a part of the camp. The day's coming, you're going to see his people flee in the camp. All over. He says in the book of Revelation, doesn't he say, come out of her, my people. Come out of that harlot, that prostitute that has prostituted God, who's been the unfaithful bride that married herself to the spirit of the world instead of waiting as a chaste version for Christ. Then we've got to get, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of Christ, even the depths of God. I tell you, we've got to be delivered from the shallowness too. There, no Christian should be shallow. If we really are Spirit-filled, we're going to be searching the depths of everything even the depths of God. Prophets are not exempt from walking the fruit of the Spirit. We know that. It is a much higher authority and much better to be known by God and have authority with God than to have it with men. Now I'm going to share with you a couple of thoughts that may seem, that can't be right. I struggle with it too. I understand how your first response is going to be, wait a minute, that can't be right. Matthew 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And we know that. It's not saying the right things that gets us there. It's those who do his will. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you know you can do miracles in his name? You can give ac accurate prophecies? And the Lord not know you? Okay, now think of this. How does that work? Doesn't he know our thoughts? Does anyone know us better than God? He... He does, and he can know all of our thoughts. But let me just lay out a consideration for you to noodle with and determine if this is true or not. The Lord will not force himself on his bride. He will not even violate our thoughts. He could. 
Maybe in some way he can know all of our thoughts, and yet not know. I don't know how this works. It's way over my head. But I know this is true. How does the Lord not know me? He knows me, everything about me. <clears throat> this is knowing like a bride and a bridegroom know each other. Okay. This is intimacy. Okay, and it's real. It's not just some doctrine. It's very real. It's not physical, it's spiritual. But the Lord doesn't know many things about us unless we share it with him. He wants that communication with his bride. He wants her to volunteer herself to him. Can you get it? How about all the Psalms? You see King David doing that. He is just letting all of his filthy garbage out and the Lord's dealing with it. He's being, I think one of the keys to King David being who he was, he was an authentic person. He was not a fake even before God, he was going to share all of his bad thoughts. All the things he wanted to do to his enemies, all the things, he just poured them out. <clears throat> Don't assume. We've got to get real with God. We've got to get real with God in every way you can get real. Can't be any more fake intercession. Trying to just act like we're bearing a heavy burden we're not feeling anything don't fake anything in the kingdom don't try to be an expressive worshiper so that you'll be seen by men you just made yourself a false worshiper you're fake you're false this is all about truth to be that fake we're lawless we're making it up ourselves. We're making up our own way. We're not walking in the way he called us to walk. Okay. Now, last night I just asked the Lord, what do you think about this war in Israel? He talked to me about his burden about the pain he was feeling. He let me taste, I'm sure it was a minute gazillionth of what he was feeling. It was unimaginable pain and sorrow for what the families they are going through. This is what got me on both sides. On both sides. He loves all men. He is deeply grieved, deeply burdened by what is happening. And if we are called to be real intercessors, which is the foundation of prophetic ministry by which we become his true friends, we bear his burden. We are called to bear some burdens for God, which he could do without us, but he has made this thing so that he needs us. For certain things. He needs us. I thought that was blasphemy. Couldn't imagine. He's God Almighty. He can do all things. He can do all things. But He created in a way He needs us. If we don't do our part, it doesn't get done. We can make His burdens lighter. Now, it's a noble thing. It's a good thing to try to be an intercessor and to pray to make people's burdens lighter. To pray for people and what they're going through, that's the burden he's carrying. But let us, I think it's a higher thing we think, we're going to try to help him. Okay. I want to Here's a scripture I wrestle with for decades. I 
I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the screen, but I'm going to tell you about it. This has amazed me. I could not figure out what this means. My whole life, my whole Christian life, I got it last night. I understood it. Paul in Colossians 1.24. He said, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What could be lacking in the afflictions of Christ? What could he be talking about here? Didn't he say it is finished? Redemption is finished. He bore our sins. That's done. It's not what we're talking about. He's still bearing our suffering, our pain, our sorrows. And he left some for his body to do. That he left behind for us to do. I think it was represented by the two scapegoats. If you remember, on the Day of Atonement, they, they brought in two scapegoats. The high priest had to touch both of them to represent. He was identifying with both of them. Then one was set free in the wilderness and one was sacrificed. That one set free was his church, was for his church. We've got some sufferings to bear. I'll do almost anything to keep from suffering. My philosophy is no pain, no pain. I really don't like pain, don't want any. It's only recently I've really been in touch with how much pain can hurt. Now I'm going to have a lot more sympathy for people, compassion maybe. I was lacking in compassion there. I really did. I was just saying, what's your problem? Get up, get going. Get in a fight. <clears throat> I experienced pain where you couldn't get in a fight. I just leave that scripture with you. Now, I, had a, I experienced that scripture with the Lord. I tell you, God needs us. He composed things. He created this plan so that he would need his pride. We can help alleviate his pain. You know, <clears throat> may not sound very profound now. You may all know this. I may be the Slowest one in the kingdom to get it. But it's, you know, somehow we've got to say it's not about us. It's really about him. The temple is for the Lord, not the Lord for the temple. It is. He's going to bless us. He wants to do all those things. Yeah. How does he not know us when he can know all of our thoughts and all. He's chosen, I believe, especially in relation with his bride. And I think very few Christians are actually living as a member of the bride. And that's biblical too. There are many are called to be a part of the wedding feast. They come to the feast. They're Lord's people. They're not a part of that bride. You're going to be a part of the bride. You're going to be one with him. There is a distinction. There are many distinctions like this in Scripture. There are those in Revelation 3, the great company that stands before his throne, made up of all nations. And then there are those in Revelation 7, 
that overcome and sit with him on his throne. We are determining in this life where we're going to be forever. The lowest place in the kingdom is going to be more wonderful than we can now comprehend. That's not the issue. I would like to ask you to consider praying. There's a lot of things we can do to become more authentic in our prayer. Start sharing with God, verbalizing your most intimate fears, your deepest fears, your ugly thoughts, some of these ugly things. Communicate with him as if he didn't know this without you sharing it with him. And the truth is he may not. You know, the problem with those who were doing all the miracles and prophesying and everything, he said, I don't even know you. It was, their problem was not not knowing him. They knew him. They were doing all these things in his name. That wasn't the problem. That's not a problem. The problem is he doesn't know us. He doesn't know us. I saw part of him last night. I never knew. I never even conceived before. But it did something in me where, no, man, I've got to change. I've got, this is different. And I do pray a lot, and I try to pray all the time. I've really been on trying to take every thought captive, trying to do a lot of these things for a long time. And uh, I love the intercession room. I wish I could be in it more, but I love doing it alone with the Lord too and whatever. I, we were made for this. But I tell you, we got to take it up a level. There's Nicholas back there. Just saw Nicholas stand up. I just told everybody who you were. <laughs> so don't mess up now. Make me look bad. <laughs> but uh, no, he's one of our best friends in the ministry too. He's been a, on the board of Morning Star for many years. One of our biggest helps in the ministry, you know, giving us direction, guidance, and help. But uh, we have many. We're blessed with an unbelievable uh, group. <clears throat> but more than anything else, I hope you're getting what I'm saying. And this is the foundation of the prophetic. You've heard it before. You've got to become an intercessor. It's on the high priest's garments, you know, where the hem of his garment had bells and pomegranates interspersed. Bells represent the prophetic, the proclamation, the message going forth. Pomegranates were used to make medicine in those days. This was a message or a symbolic message that whenever the high priest moved, the message of healing went forth. And this is why the prophetic is so deeply connected to healing. This is why I believe the woman with the issue of blood, she knew, she knew who Jesus was. She saw him. Isn't faith seeing him? You know, true faith is not faith in an outcome. It's faith in a person. She saw him. He's the high priest. But he looks like a shepherd. He looks like a, a bum from Nazareth. No, he's the high priest. She knew if she touched the hem of his garment that rep just represented healing, she could be healed. Do we see him? Do we know him? Does he know us? Now, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's always appropriate. Ecclesiastes 3, it's time for peace and a time for war. It's not time for peace now. It's time for war. This thing is escalating daily. 
could escalate into something more terrible than we've ever conceived and more terrible right here in our own shores. It's headed that way. If it doesn't change its direction, it's going to end up where it's headed. That's where it's headed. I don't know if this is the time when what I saw in my dream is going to happen. But we've come to the ultimate battle between light and darkness. Let's win the one inside here of all the ways that we've been compromised so that we can recognize truth. To recognize truth, you've got to be true. You've got to walk in truth. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're heading for really difficult times. Paul said, through many tribulations shall we enter the kingdom of God. Every trial, we can enter the kingdom. There's a doorway to the kingdom. The whole world is being shown a doorway to the kingdom right now. Israel's going to see clearly the doorway to the kingdom. The world's going to see. Whether we choose to see or just turn our eyes it's what this time is for. Most of the world's going to say, I don't want to see that. We've got to see it. Okay, but it's time for war. Don't start prophesying peace. I tell you, it's a tragedy what happened to our military in Afghanistan. One of the most humiliating things ever to our military and now the same people are trying to consult Israel how to conduct this war. I pray they don't listen. They turn to God and listen to him. It's time to quit flailing at the branches and put the ax to the root of the tree. The root of the tree to everything that's going on over there right now is in the the regime, Iranian regime. Not the Iranian people. Some of the best people you'll ever meet. It's been one of the greatest revivals in the last few decades. It's been in Iran. Persian people are some of the greatest people. They were used at one time to save Israel from extinction. That's what the book of Esther is all about. I pray they, that mantle will rise on the Persian people again. But I tell you, there's got to be a war. There's got to be a, a victory. And I'm praying for the leaders to have wise counselors, Joseph's, Daniel's, where, but also to learn the wisdom of, Saul, of Joshua in the battle of Ai. When he learned, when he held the spear out, Israel prevailed. When he brought the spear back, the enemies of God would prevail. Finally, he learned to hold the spear out until the enemy was completely destroyed. There's got to be a complete and total destruction of the enemy, which is the Iranian regime. It's going to come to that. The ultimate fight, if this isn't it and somehow... Peace comes without that happening. And this conflict or an end to the conflict comes without that happening. There's going to be a bigger, worse battle right down the road. It's not going to, this battle is not going to quit without that happening. So pray that they are also able to resist pressure, threats, and things like that from wickedness within our own government evil and those who are aligned with evil and are doing evil even doing evil to us it is treason the way our borders have not been defended and protected that's treason and the way they've let the evil hordes of hell come across our southern border they're coming across our northern border and every other way they can come in to do us harm it has been treason that allowed that. And our present leaders are treasonous. Yeah. 
they have betrayed us. There's no other way to put it. And we've got to start speaking the truth as it is. But one other thing, we do serve the King of Kings, who's over all authority, all power. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. There's a difference between power and authority. All authority has been given to the king, to Jesus. And he has all power already. He's all powerful. He just has not exercised his power yet. He will. Don't worry. He will. We're going to have to see all the ugliness, all the darkness that has been sown in mankind before he's going to do that. And that will be the only option for mankind is God. There won't be any other way except he save us. We're living in these times. We get to be here. And we can be his best friends. By you becoming a true friend of God, absolutely resolute to be his intercessor, to be his friend, to carry his burdens. He has burdens. Throughout the prophecies in Scripture, it talks about the burden of the Lord. That's what all the prophets carried. Are we carrying the burden of the Lord or the burden of men? Are we carrying the burden of the Lord or the burden of politics? Are we going to be prophet, the true prophets? We're going to carry, help him carry his burden. He made it so he needed us to do that. And that's how we're going to more closely align with him, be one with him, become one with him for an eternal union that will last forever. He made it so he would need us. He needs us now. Amen.